Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Oppenheimer. So uh, it's still a few minutes until two, so I'm going to wait until two to actually start before everyone gets here. But yeah. All right, so today we are moving on to part two, to volume two of the transcript. Um, that's going to be very fun. So, man, it is currently 103 degrees outside where I am in Houston. Uh, it's, it's really awful. It's no good. Uh, here's my weather app. 103. It's very, very brutal. It's funny, you would think I would be able to take it because I've lived in Florida for so long, but somehow this feels worse. But I am inside right now, so that makes things much better. I am inside and I am live streaming about Oppenheimer. Let me edit this for a sec. The chat box got messed up. Okay, there we go. Awesome. So, so yeah. Today, I am in my school library. We have these study rooms that you can rent out for free for a few hours, uh, and that's very nice because it means that I can record, I can record my live stream uh, in a relatively tranquil environment. So, last time I was in my dorm, and it was kind of late at night, and so people were like running around the hallways and acting crazy and whatnot. So. Uh, I decided that probably wasn't going to work anymore. But yeah, this is a nice little room. There's a whiteboard over there uh, with some Expo markers. That might be fun to use. Uh, I haven't thought of a use for it yet, so I'll have to think about that. But yeah, so I'm just chilling out today, and it's going to be another chill stream of reading and commentary on Oppenheimer. Uh, and I'll also remind everyone that if you have any questions about the history or the science surrounding the topics uh, that come up today in this transcript or my commentary, feel free to just uh, drop a comment in the chat and ask me a question about it, because I love talking to you guys and uh, hearing what you guys have to say. So, yeah, let's just get started. Um, Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'll point out a few things. Today is Tuesday, April 13th, 1954. Uh, it's the second day of Oppenheimer's hearings. And today there's going to be one witness other than Oppenheimer named Mervyn J. Kelly. So a bit about Mervyn J. Kelly. I actually have a slide for him in which I've included a Wikipedia page, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, Mervyn Kelly. So he was the president of Bell Laboratories, uh, which is a private institution, but it's also a research facility. And I, I don't know what he's going to say. I guess he worked with Oppenheimer at one point. Um, we'll learn more about that as the stream goes on. Here, wait, I'll just Command F Oppenheimer to see if anything comes up on it. No, nothing about Oppenheimer on his Wikipedia page. So I'm wondering how his testimony is going to fit in to the general story here. Uh, yeah, so we'll see. It'll be a bit of a surprise. Uh, I learn a lot while reading these transcripts, actually, about history and science and stuff. So yeah, uh, let's let's just get started. 
let me see actually I just want to do one final uh, check of the audio so give me a sec Yeah, so I think there's some people in one of the study rooms next to me, and you can kind of hear them through the walls, but that's kind of unavoidable. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to get started. All right. So, let's, let's begin. Actually, I wonder if there's a way I can reduce... Advanced audio properties. Mic audio monitoring. I want to see if there's a way to um, create uh, to minimize background noise. Um, maybe filters. There's no filters. Let's add one. Noise suppression. Let's try that. Okay. Okay, let's see if that'll work. Um, noise suppression is now in effect. Sorry for the delay. Um, just trying to work this out. So let's see if we can hear the other person. Okay, still not great. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I can do here. Otherwise, I'm just going to get going. Okay, I'm just going to start. Um, all right. So, we've got Oppenheimer. Uh, all right, so let me let me start with the first person that's going to be talking. That's going to be Mr. Gray. Um, so we'll start with him. Okay, so the above entitled matter came on for hearing pursuant to recess before the board at 9.30 a.m. Personnel Security Board, and we have Dr. Gray, Dr. Ward, Mr. Thomas. Uh, we have Roger Robb. We have C.A. Rolander. We have... Oppenheimer, we have Lloyd Garrison, we have Samuel Silverman, Alan Ecker, and yeah, and that's it. So that's who's in the room right now. As you can see in the uh, bottom left, that's everyone listed that's in the room right now. All right, so Mr. Gray begins. I would like to call the proceeding to order. The chairman of the board has a few observations to make, and I have a few questions to ask on behalf of the board. I should like to read again for the record a statement which I made yesterday, that the proceedings and stenographic record of this board are regarded as strictly confidential between AEC officials participating in this matter and Dr. Oppenheimer, his representatives, and witnesses. The AEC will not take the initiative in public release of any information relating to proceedings before this board. The board views with very deep concern stories in the press which have been brought to the attention of members of the board. 
I personally have not had time to read the New York Times article, but I am told that both the Nichols letter to Dr. Oppenheimer of December 23 and his reply of March 4 are reprinted in full. Without having any information whatsoever, I have to assume that this was given to the New York Times. Dr. Oppenheimer says... It says so in the paper. I do not suggest that represents a violation of security. I have a serious question about the spirit in keeping with the statement we made for the record yesterday about these proceedings being a matter of confidential relationship between the commission and the board representing the commission and Dr. Oppenheimer and his representatives and witnesses. We were told yesterday before this hearing began that you were doing all you could to keep this out of the press. You said you were late yesterday because you had fingers in the dike. I believe was your expression, which I found somewhat confusing against subsequent events in the day when you, say, when you say that you gave everything that you had to the press. We agreed yesterday that it would be very unfortunate to have this proceeding conducted in the press. There was no dissent from that view which was expressed, I believe, by all of us. So this is interesting because in the movie they mention how Oppenheimer at first tried to talk to President Truman directly about, you know, not going forward with the H-bomb project, but that didn't really work. Uh, Truman didn't really care. And so instead, he basically took his expertise to the press and started advocating against the development of further atomic bombs in the press, rather than directly through uh, political officials, just because that was more effective. So uh, it kind of makes sense that Maybe Oppenheimer would sort of go to the press to talk about what's going on here. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll see how this develops. All right. I think that it should be perfectly apparent, particularly to the attorneys involved, that this board faces real difficulties if each day matters about this proceeding appear not on the basis of rumors or gossip, but on the basis of information handed directly to the press. I think it only fair to say for the record that the board is very much concerned. I should like to ask some questions for the record about the authorized spokesman for Dr. Oppenheimer. I assume in addition to Dr. Oppenheimer that Mr. Garrison, Mr. Silverman, and Mr. Ecker are actively and officially associated in this proceeding. I should like to ask who else is working on this? Who may be talking to the press? Mr. Garrison says... Mr. Chairman, perhaps you could let me answer that question by a little history. The letter from the commission was given on December 23rd. I came into the case early in January. Almost immediately, or perhaps the middle of January, it became quite apparent from inquiries that Mr. Reston addressed both to the AEC and to Dr. Oppenheimer that he already had information that clearance had been suspended and that proceedings were going forward against Dr. Oppenheimer. He was most anxious to obtain background information from us. We explained to him the nature of the proceedings and our earnest desire that this not be the subject. May I correct that? Was this your conversation with Reston? Because I believe the initial conversations were with me. He called and he was very persistent in calling. I tried to evade it. I knew what it would be about. After about five or six days of persistent telephoning, he talked to my wife and said that he had this story and he wished I would talk to him. I talked to him on the phone. I said I thought it contrary to the national interest that the story should be published, that I did not propose to discuss it with him, but if the time came when it was a public story, I would be glad to discuss it with him. That was mid-January. I don't remember the date. I am depending on counsel's memory. I believe that was the substance of our talk. He told me two things. First, that my clearance had been revoked, that was the story he had heard, that this had been cabled, telegraphed, and broadcast to submarine commanders throughout the fleet and army posts throughout the world, and second, that Senator McCarthy was fully aware of this and thought I ought to know that. That was the end of that discussion. I was given to understand by proffers of kindness, but not other but not other sign, that the Alsips knew the situation. Later, this was confirmed by one of the prospective witnesses. You did not talk with either of the Alsips? I have not talked to either one of the Alsips until very recently, 
and I will describe those conversations. This was long ago, and it was my affair, and I, though my memory would be more vivid than yours, and I thought my memory would be more vivid than yours. Why don't you tell of your conversation with the Alsips? That is not until very recently. Stuart Alsip called co-counsel. Here, wait one second, gonna make an adjustment. Um, just a few adjustments here, just for readability for myself. Um, okay, so. Okay. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna start over. So that is not until very recently. Stuart Alsip called co-counsel, that is Herbert Marx, whose name should be in these proceedings. When would that have been? Saturday, Friday, quite recently, saying that they had the story and were frantic to publish and that I should call Joe Alsip, who is up in Connecticut at a rest home in Garrison, New York. I did call him there. I put on my spiel the thing that I have said to everyone, that I thought this story coming out before the matter was resolved could do the country no good. Either I was a traitor and very, very important secrets had been in jeopardy over the last 12 years, or the government was acting in a most peculiar way to take proceedings against me at this moment. This is the impression that I feared would be made. Neither impression could be good. Having both of them could be only doubly bad. That's pretty funny. I detect the sarcasm there. Um, anyway. Uh, so, we continue. Therefore, not as far as I was concerned, but as far as what I thought was right, I urged Joe Alsip to hold his story, not to publish it. We did not discuss any substantive things, except that Alsip told me how apprehensive he was that Senator McCarthy would come out with it. I believe that was all I said to Joe Alsip. He said he thought I was making a great mistake, but I said it was my mistake to make. I recognized, of course, that he could publish any moment that he wanted to. May I ask, as of this time, or 10 o'clock yesterday morning, had you given the New York Times these documents? These documents were given to Reston by my counsel Friday night, I believe without any instruction as to what he was to do with them, as background material. So that you knew when you made the statement here yesterday morning that you were keeping the finger in the dike that these documents dated December 23rd and March 4th, were already in the possession of the New York Times. Indeed we did. Mr. Chairman, they were given to Mr. Reston with instructions not to be used unless it became essential for the Times to release the story because others were going to do likewise. We hoped, even as of yesterday, the last word we had with Mr. Reston was after lunch, we hoped, even as of yesterday, that this could be held off although I told you at the start that it might be only a matter of hours. You didn't indicate to me in any way, if you attempted to do so, it is a matter of my misinterpretation, that you had given documents which relate to these confidential proceedings and are part of these proceedings. Let's see. Okay. Uh, um... You mentioned Mr. Marx. Who else is authorized to speak to you, Dr. Oppenheimer? No one else. Mr. Marx is not counsel of record on this proceeding. He has been associated with us from the start because of his knowledge of past history. I am still seeking his guidance and help. He is assisting, I take it, in preparing these documents which you present. No, we did all that work ourselves. May I ask specifically for the record who prepared the excerpts about which I asked the question yesterday? We did in our own office. I did. Mr. Ecker worked on them. 
I should like to know, Mr. Garrison, why it was yesterday that not one of the three of you could answer the question as to whether these paragraphs were consecutive or came from consecutive pages. It is apparent that someone else had prepared them. No, Mr. Chairman. I have drawn a conclusion. If I am wrong, I am sorry that such thoughts should even occur to you. What happened was that some weeks ago I went through Dr. Oppenheimer's writings and I marked particular sections and passages from a lot of them that seemed to me worthy of presentation to the board, and I asked that they be extracted and copied out. I have not been over them for some time, to be frank with you. I have had so much else to do. My point in raising all this is that if there are a good number of people who are not appearing here who are going to be talking to the press, I would like to know what control or lack of control there may be in this situation. That is why I am raising this thing. Yes. I think these stories are very prejudicial to the spirit of inquiry that I tried to establish as an atmosphere for this hearing as we started yesterday. I would very much regret that what would appear to be the board's possible lack of cooperation in conducting these proceedings in the press if that were prejudicial to what are the basic fundamental issues involved. Might I, a might I ask a question, Mr. Garrison, or Mr. Chairman? Um, yes. I don't think we have identified Mr. Marks. Mr. Herbert S. Marks, former general counsel of the Atomic Energy Commission and a lawyer in Washington. He is an attorney and member of the District of Columbia Bar. Yes. And do I understand he is of counsel to Dr. Oppenheimer? He is associated with us as counsel. In the relationship of lawyer and client, is that correct? Yes. Uh, oh wait, still Mr. Garrison. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I just say another thing about the problem that we faced? Mr. Reston, from the middle of January, has had the ALSIPs, and I don't know who else, busy gathering information from anybody they could find, and had developed so much of the story when Mr. Reston talked with us on Friday that it seemed to us that if the story had to break, that rather than half a story or two-thirds of it or a quarter of it, in fragments with constant demands afterwards from the press for the rest of it, that it was better that the basic documents be there for all to see. This was not a happy decision or a pleasant one for Dr. Oppenheimer, believe me, to have the letter of charges displayed for the American public. It was something no man would ever wish to do. It was not until Mr. Reston told us yesterday afternoon that the thing absolutely could not hold, the stories were going to be published, Alsip said the same thing, that we said, all right, go ahead then, and print the documents. Now, it is not our purpose to make any press comments upon this case. It is not our purpose to release any transcripts. If you will observe the Reston story, I am sure you will see that we have tried to avoid any kind of special pleading. Dr. Oppenheimer has made no statement. We are not trying to try this case ourselves in the press. I assure you with all earnestness that is true. I feel absolutely certain that it is better in the long run for the government, for this board, and for us that there be no suspicion about what is the scope of this case whether the H-bomb is in it, and all those kinds of questions that would arise if the actual facts had not been disclosed. May I point out, if I may interrupt, there was an item in the Reston story, however, it is understood that he, Dr. Oppenheimer, also put in evidence another secret document in the form of a memorandum. We haven't the faintest idea what they are talking about, nor did we give them any such information. Who is we? Who actually handed the documents to Mr. Reston? I did myself, Mr. Chairman, personally. Did he also get a copy of this, uh, of this autobiography? No. Mr. Garrison, may I ask another question? Didn't I understand you to say yesterday morning that explaining your tardiness at the hearing that you had been engaged in a press conference no, I had been engaged in threshing this problem out among ourselves because the calls were coming in and putting us under the greatest pressure. 
In fact, right along, we have been under pressure to make statements, to initiate statements of our own, and come forward with information. It has been a very, very difficult undertaking, Mr. Chairman. I am quite aware of that. On the other hand, you are quite aware also that the members of this board have been under pressure, and that we have, I believe, without fail, said we will not discuss it. That will continue to be our position. I should also like to say that we do not disclose to anybody. When I say we, I mean every one of the council, to my knowledge, and Dr. Oppenheimer, the names of this board, or where the hearings were being held, or anything else. Uh, this one. Where did they get it? I don't know. I have no idea. They called me up about 1.30. They called me too, but I didn't answer the phone. I would like to move to another point, if I may. I'm sorry we are keeping Dr. Kelly waiting. This has to do with the schedule of hearings. You left a suggested typewritten schedule with us yesterday, which was not made a part of the record. I think I should say that the board cannot accept this as a schedule. I repeat, indeed, if it is necessary to repeat, that this is to be a fair inquiry, that Dr. Oppenheimer will be given full and adequate opportunity to make any presentation he has and to present such witnesses as he desires. But as far as the schedule is concerned, the board feels that it is up to Dr. Oppenheimer and counsel to furnish the witnesses and information for the board. We propose to sit from 9 if it is desired by Dr. Oppenheimer and his counsel, or from 9.30 to 12.30, and from 2 until approximately 4.30. Give and take a little because of circumstances. Frankly, I think the board is unwilling to commit itself to a schedule which I am sure means that we will have some witnesses on a certain day who will be through and then there is nothing more for the board to do or for a part of, that, of the day. I should like to suggest, Mr. Garrison, that we inform you again that we will meet and we will hear the witnesses and some approach be made to this problem from the point of view of the convenience of this board and not the convenience of the witnesses, as would be true in most proceedings in the American tradition. If it seems to be necessary to hear a witness at a particular time in accordance with some prearranged schedule some days in advance, I think you should be warned that the witness will probably be asked under oath whether this is the only time that he could appear. If we run into a situation where we must recess or delay proceedings because of a witness who has said, I can come on a certain date, we, uh, sorry, I can come on a certain date. We understand, we understand fully, we understand fully that Dr. Kelly can be, can only be here this morning. We are very glad to hear him and we will hear him. Uh, then I would very much prefer, and the members of the board would, if we could receive the remainder of Dr. Oppenheimer's presentation and proceed with whatever period it seems desirable of questioning Dr. Oppenheimer, and then try to move forward with receiving testimony from the witnesses. So I don't think that we wish to commit ourselves to a schedule which draws it out precisely as this is drawn. I am hopeful you will find that we will be reasonable and fair in hearing the witnesses. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to your wishes that you expressed informally to us yesterday, I arranged for Dr. Bush to appear instead of this morning on Monday afternoon, instead of this morning on Monday afternoon, the 19th, and I have arranged with Mr. Gordon Dean to appear Monday morning, the 19th, in lieu of Wednesday afternoon. I would say, Mr. Garrison, this is quite all right with the board. This is a part of your responsibility of keeping witnesses and whatever else is to be presented to the board moving along as we sit and are available to hear them. I have no doubt that we shall fill the afternoon session on the 19th so that there will be no waste of time of the board because there are still several witnesses whom we have contemplated calling and we have not had a chance to, yet to talk with them. All right, sir. For example, Mr. Conant, Mr. Bradbury, and several others. If you will indulge me, I would like to say one other word about counsel, because I think there has been some mystery, perhaps, created by Mr. Marks' relationship to the case. Mr. Marks is an old, very dear, and very personal friend of Dr. Oppenheimer. They both came to see me when I was asked to serve as counsel. I am serving without fee in this case as a public service. 
To the best of my knowledge, Mr. Marx is serving without fee in this case as a gesture of very deep friendship and admiration for Dr. Oppenheimer. We have been working together, he and I, as one would work together in a matter of this sort, without any really formal relationship, except that it was understood that I would, in effect, try the case, conduct the proceedings, and have the final decision and responsibility. He is now simply going about his law practice, and as I feel that I use his advice and need him, Dr. Oppenheimer learns very heavily, leans very heavily on his opinions, on his opinions. We meet together and talk things over. It is that kind of relationship. It never occurred to me that it would be necessary or that I would be not frank with the board in not entering his appearance here today, because actually we are the council conducting this proceeding and I have the final decision. But I want you to be quite sure that Mr. Marx is not authorized by me to talk with the press or to exercise himself in any fashion on this matter. He is a friend and advisor and associate uh, in that sense. So this is very interesting um, that the board, at least uh, Mr. Uh, Gray, seems very upset with this leaking to the press uh, because his intention was to keep this, you know, on the down low. And now he's getting phone calls from journalists and that is, you know, not something he wants to deal with. Uh, and it's interesting, just like, how did this get out? Um, it sounds that this is more just like a matter of public records, so it just kind of got out anyway that these uh, hearings were happening. But, you know, some of the details, uh, they're wondering, like, okay, how did the press fill this in? Because, you know, only a few people could have known this, so it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, but yes, anyway... Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer. He is sometimes authorized to talk to the press in specific ways and with a specific message. Both he and I have had conversations with Mr. Reston and Mr. Alsip, and other newspaper men have called him up, but what I am trying to say is that Mr. Marx is not sitting in his office at my request conducting press conferences to spread information about this case. You can be just as sure as that but he is authorized to speak to the press, at least those were Dr. Oppenheimer's words. He is not authorized to conduct press conferences. He cannot avoid inquiries when they come to him. As far as I know, Mr. Chairman, we are all going to be battered. I was called at quarter to seven this morning. You can't avoid the call, but I can say to you on, this, on the basis of personal experience that it is possible not to talk. That is what all of us have pledged each other to do, that is, not to talk. As of what time did you take that pledge? We decided when the documents were made public that ends this matter as far as we are concerned. Fine. I am sorry we kept Dr. Kelly waiting. Would you get him in, if you are ready now, to present Dr. Kelly? Okay, so now... Dr. Kelly is sworn in. So Dr. Kelly is entering the room. Oppenheimer is, you know, sitting off to the side. And Kelly is on the witness stand. So Oppenheimer is just like off to the side there. And now Kelly is being spoken to. Oh, I see a uh, comment in the chat from Mr. Clown. He says, hi. Hello, Mr. Clown. How are you doing on this fine Sunday afternoon? Um, let's see. Feel free to ask any questions if you have them. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to continue. Okay. Whereupon, Mervyn J. Kelly was called as a witness and, having been first duly sworn, was examined and testified as follows. Mr. Gray says, Mr. Kelly, do you wish to testify under oath? You are not required to do so. Dr. Kelly says, 
I would be glad to testify under oath. Will you stand then, please, and raise your right hand? Mervyn J. Kelly, do you swear that the testimony you are to give to the board shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Kelly says, I do. And now direct examination by Mr. Garrison. Um, okay. So Garrison says, Dr. Kelly, you are the president of the Bell Telephone Laboratory in New York City. I am. And in 1950 to 1951, you served on a research and development board panel under Dr. Oppenheimer's chairmanship. That is correct. You had met Dr. Oppenheimer before that time. Oh, yes. Could you say when you first met him? It was at either a National Academy meeting, what is this thing in Philadelphia we belong to, the American Philosophical Society meeting in Philadelphia shortly after the war, late 1945 or early 1946, Oppie was addressing a meeting there at the time. Would you tell the board very briefly about your work with Dr. Oppenheimer on the Research and Development Board panel? The Research and Development Board has had an Atomic Energy Standing Committee. At that time, Robert LeBaron, Mr. William Webster, was the head of the Robert LeBaron, comma, Mr. William Webster. I don't know which one of these two is the head, but anyway. At that time, Robert LeBaron, Mr. William Webster, was the head of the Research and Development Board. At Mr. Webster's request or suggestion, Mr. LeBaron formed a panel at, in the late fall of 1949, as I remember. I had a letter from Mr. LeBaron in early November concerning serving on the panel, in which he told me that Dr. Oppenheimer was to be the chairman. I accepted membership and then had relations with Dr. Oppenheimer from then on about it. We had our first meeting early in December. The committee had nine members, three military, three of the more academic scientists, and three of the less academic. General Jay McCormick, who was then the military officer in the AEC, reporting to the general manager in charge of military programs, was ex officio and at all meetings. The group was made up of Dr. Oppenheimer as chairman, Dr. Bakker, then of Caltech. He had been on the commission. Dr. Luis Alvarez of the University of California, Professor Charles Lauritsen of Caltech, Professor Walter Whitman of MIT, and myself were the civilians. The three military members were General K.D. Nichols of the Army, Admiral W.S. Parsons of the Navy, and General R.C. Wilson of the Air Force. The general charge to the committee was for it to view the status of atomic research in the commission and its progress, the state of the stockpile, with the knowledge of the weaponry to come up with recommendations for the scope and emphasis in the military applications of the research and development program. Then Mr. Gray interjects. Dr. Kelly, may I interrupt for a moment? I am afraid I failed to tell you that in the event that it is necessary for you to discuss any restrict restricted data, I would appreciate your letting me know that you propose to do so. I don't propose to say anything here that in a closed hearing is not perfectly all right. All right, sir. I was stating the scope of the examination as requested by Mr. LeBaron. I think I had completed by saying that we were going to look at what the military applications of the research and development program should be in the light of advancing knowledge in the atomic area and the stockpile in the military situation. We had about six days in December of meetings and went over this whole matter. It was the first time that I had seen Dr. Oppenheimer in action, in an operating sense, in a responsibility of this kind. He was an unusually able chairman. I have been on lots of committees and chairman of some, and I would put him right at the top in his patience in developing... Uh-oh. Something quit unexpectedly on my computer. Let's make sure this is not a problem. Oh, it's just Apple Music. Okay. Let me just make sure everything's still going. Because... 
You never like to see something that says quit unexpectedly. Okay, I think it's still running. Okay, uh, yeah, I don't know what the problem there was. Uh, let's just continue. Okay. So, all right. He was an unusually able chairman. I have been on lots of committees and chairman of some, and I would put him right at the top in his patience in developing views and, uh, and getting the views of everyone and promoting full discussion and yet giving the minimum of waste time for busy people that goes with the committees of that size. We came up after much discussion with very common views because it was in an area where, excepting for the enemy situation, there was generally a background of factual knowledge to work on. After we had gotten to where we had a commonness of view as to what we would say, the program should be in scope and emphasis, Dr. Oppenheimer undertook the job of preparing our report, which was an aid to all of us. I remember his staying in Washington between meetings and beyond meetings for drafting the report. He drafted a report which, with very minor modifications, I would say all of us could sign as representing fully our own views as to what the military emphasis in research and development should be. This was just at the threshold of the time where atomic basic knowledge had reached the point that it was possible to consider versatility. By that, I mean extending the range of weapons well beyond that of the large free-falling bombs. So this was rather a critical time. That opportunity for extending the scope of weapons, that is, the range of versatility in military action, was a thing that needed very careful weighing and was weighed and our report encompassed the views on how that should be broadened. As a matter of fact, I know from my participation in the program that what had happened in the succeeding years was very much along the line or substantially identical to the charter that we suggested as the research and development programming plan. Mr. LeBaron wrote to me, and no doubt other members of the committee afterwards, expressing appreciation and stating the way that it had been accepted favorably in both the commission and the military. Throughout this, Dr. Oppenheimer was one of us in views that is had common views with us as to the best military use of the fissionable materials and the kind of weapons that should be put into development and in discussion there was very ev and in discussion there was every evidence of his dedication to the best use of this kind of power in the national interest possible any divergence in views as they developed were detailed and no greater difference in his views on that from one of us to the other than there would be between any two of us. Did you ever deduce that Dr. Oppenheimer ever overstated, in your opinion, the need of continental defense as distinguished from the production of offensive weapons and plans? Quite the contrary. Dr. Oppenheimer's views on continental defense are so close to those that I have held from my close contact with it that I could not distinguish a difference. In the late fall of 1952, Secretary Lovett asked me to head a civilian committee made up principally of top business leaders such as Bob Wilson of Standard Oil and top educational people to survey the continental defense program and to put it in proper perspective with the rest of our deterrent efforts. General McCormick, who had then come over into the Air Force, I succeeded in getting as a secretary to my committee. During the progress of the committee's work, which was in the first several months of 1953, the committee was then operating under Secretary Wilson, but Mr. Lovett had cleared with him when he appointed us in November that he wanted us to continue because it was going into the new administration of Mr. Wilson. And a number of times, General McCormick, for me, as I had a lot of other responsibilities, saw Dr. Oppenheimer. I know particularly of two visits. I remember two visits to Princeton where he discussed with Dr. Oppenheimer the evolving report and views. Of course, this could be said to be hearsay, but he recounted to me Dr. Oppenheimer's comments, which were wholly favorable and differed only in insignificant detail. 
Dr. Oppenheimer felt it was a constructive judgment, which was in general that while the country had not given proper emphasis to continental defense relatively, yet that our chief deterrent was strike, and that nothing should be done in bringing up to a proper level a continental defense effort that would weaken our strike. That was the general philosophy. We recommended certain organizational and planning and procedural things to unify the program, but placed it second to strike in the general program of our best defense and best deterrent aspect. With the discussions that General McCormick had with him, I could distinguish no difference. In fact, he spoke very complimentary, so General McCormick related to me, of the direction our thinking was taking. I do not find the time to do a lot of talking about these things that are directly concerned, but in the Lincoln Summer Study, two of my members were on that study, and I know from them that the views of Dr. Oppenheimer, who was there occasionally, and others of the academic side, were very strong for looking into the Arctic line and the kind of implementation that was then in breadboard state, but in proper perspective. I have since here Dr. Oppenheimer discuss the defense aspect at closed meetings in the Council of Foreign Affairs, and this is in relatively recent months, and found his views there in general accord with the ones I have held and pushed for a stronger continental defense, better organized, unified, but done not at the expense of our strike power. What would you say as to Dr. Oppenheimer's reputation for straightforwardness, directness, veracity? Among his peers, he is first known and recognized for his accuracy of thought and cleanness of expression. His words are considered generally well weighed and meaningful because of their accuracy and because of their accuracy and temperateness. I would know of no one that knew him as well as I that would feel that he overstated his position. As to his veracity and dedication, I know of no one in the program, with the high clearances that he has had and that I have had, Q and top secret, everything, has, everything he has done and said gives a full appearance to a great dedication, as full an appearance as any of us that are in and still cleared. Would you say that as chairman of this panel he made a contribution to the national welfare? I am sure that he did. In the form that he writes all of his things, getting the views of the full committee that he shared as to what the forward-looking program should be, getting it clean, orderly, and well-placed was a great contribution as anyone working in the atmosphere of the Pentagon knows the great need for, that is, of getting direction and aim and purpose well spelled out. It was in this report of the panel, which was his fine, clean writing, but which was his, which was the views of all of us, which he shared. What, ha what have you to say as to his reputation for integrity and patriotism and your own personal feeling about that? Among his peers, those who know him and know his work, I would say his reputation is the highest. As to my own personal belief, I know of no one in the program that I would have any more confidence in their integrity and de dedication than I would of Dr. Oppenheimer. What would you say as to the competence of the setup at Los Alamos and Sandia to handle the whole program during the years while Dr. Oppenheimer served on the General Advisory Committee, roughly 1947 to 1952? I have known the situation there intimately since January 1949. That was my first entrance broadly into the atomic weapon area. During the war, we had quite a good-sized job at the laboratory in an area that did not concern Los Alamos directly, or Dr. Oppenheimer, and that was the research and early development of the, membrance, of the membrane used at Oak Ridge for diffusion, a very difficult physical chemical job. In early 1945, 1949, the commission asked me to make a study of the Los Alamos Sandia combined operation and make recommendations as to any organizational changes. They said they had in mind not a complete satisfaction of the applied end of the weaponry, that is, after the nuclear job was completely done, the clothing of that with all the aerodynamic, electronic, and radar gear to make the completed weapon. That is, 
that as well as the nuclear had been up at Los Alamos up until maybe a year or two. I was in, I was in, in, sorry. I was in, in 1949, and then that part of it that had to do with the weaponry exclusive of the explosive unit was moved to Sandia to be close to the military people. But both operations were under Dr. Bradbury, and that was a contract with the University of California. There was some question within the commission and Dr. Bradbury himself as to the operations in Sandia, so I spent the greater part of three months looking searchingly at Los Alamos and at Sandia and reported orally. I made the stipulation to the commission that I must do it orally, as I could not take the time for a polished, finished report, giving my judgment of the very high competence of the Los Alamos operation and the quality of the people in the program, the way they were attacking them, and while the buildings were temporary in the facilities for doing it. The applications end of clothing the unit that has the explosive with the required aerodynamic and electronics I found was not up to the capacities of the country in that kind of applied science and technology. So I recommended that part of the job be given to an industrial contractor as there were com components of engineering judgment and background at high levels that just were not in the program and also knowing how to recruit the kind of people to build such a, a staff. That recommendation was acted upon and Mr. Truman requested the AT&T that we accept that Sandia operation and a subsidiary um, sorry, here, wait. Oh, it's AT&T. I wonder if that's like the company AT&T. It's spelled out. Usually you just see AT ampersand T. But yeah, it says um, Mr. Truman requested the AT&T that we accept that Sandia operation and a subsidiary corporation of the Bell system has been formed to do that. The technical, the whole research and engineering side of it is my direct responsibility. I spend one week in five, in fact I am going out there tomorrow, so I have known the program intimately since 1949. I would say that the overall integrated program is the finest expression of American scientific and technical ability, and that we are where we are in the weapons program because of that plan for doing it, its competence, and its relative freedom to operate as scientists and technologists do in our society, relieved from a lot of restrictions that come in from civil service and other kinds of handling. As I say, the only blemish on that program in 1949 was the inadequacy of the applied technology having to do with the aerodynamics, electronics, and so on. Based on your knowledge of Dr. Oppenheimer, your experiences with him, and his reputation as you know it, do you believe that his clearance would be clearly consistent with the interest of national security? To the very best of my knowledge, I sincerely believe that, and I think that his absence from the programs and from the councils would be a distinct loss. There is one observation, as I told you, that I would like to make, if this is an appropriate time, that I think is pertinent to the aspects of the problem that I can't testify directly on. When scientists and applied scientists look into the crystal ball in the early stages when there is not enough known about the facts of nature, you can find quite wide and honest diversity of views which clear up and views become substantially common when enough knowledge of nature's laws and behaviorisms in the area come to light. Taking an example, I was thinking last night from my earliest entrance into science at the graduate level in 1914 and 18. I was Millikan's research assistant in Chicago. As I did, I did a, gen I did a great deal of the oil drop experimentation that he was doing, first to establish that there Let me check that I'm still live. This is annoying. That he was doing first to establish that there. Okay, I think I'm live now. Okay, I don't know why uh, my Wi-Fi went out for a second there, but let me just restart that paragraph and then add 
on to the comments I was making before. Uh, let me just make sure again that everything's okay. Okay. I think I'm live now. Okay. I don't know. Okay, that, that looks good. Okay, sorry about that. I shall resume with that paragraph. Um, okay. Let me actually adjust this so that I can tell very quickly if something goes wrong. Um, yeah, okay. Cool. Okay. So, taking an example, I was thinking last night from my earliest entrance into science at the graduate level in 1914 and 1918. I was Millikan's research assistant in Chicago. As I did, I did a great deal of the oil drop experimentation that he was doing, first to establish that there was an electron with a unique charge and only one electron. During the, er during the early years of that, there was quite a school of thought that there was not, that there were electrons of various sizes. I remember a distinguished professor at Vienna, whose name has slipped my mind, that published greatly on the sub-electron. By 1917, there was enough accumulation of the facts that agreed there was only one electron, which is our primer today. So I also added commentary on this that was cut out, but this is an interesting experiment. This is the Millikan oil drop experiment, where a uh, charged drop of oil was suspended in an, in an electric field, multiple uh, charged drops of oil. Uh, so they had a roughly fixed mass and, you know, different amounts of charge in them. And what they found was that the charges would hover in discrete locations as if there are discrete amount of charges that you can add to a drop of oil. So uh, rather than a continuous spectrum, which is what you would expect if there was a sub-electron, or electrons of different sizes, and you could have pretty much any charge that you want. But no, there's this fundamental charge, the charge of electron, of the electron, and the charge of each oil drop is going to be some multiple of that to work. What's going on here? What's going on here? That's on. Yeah. The charge of each oil drop is going to be some multiple of that. Okay. I think I'm live now. So, okay. So I'm just going to continue. Okay. Um, I switched Wi-Fi's. The school has two Wi-Fi's. There's the one for the students, and then there's one for guests. One would presume that the one for students would work more effectively, but we shall see. So I have now switched to the guest Wi-Fi. Anyway, uh, the Millikan oil drop experiment, I was just wrapping up, it allows you to determine that there is a dis discrete electron. It allows you to measure the fundamental charge of that electron, that being 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And it was a big experiment in particle physics because it showed that there were particles, that there were quantized units of mass that eventually, as you kept going smaller and smaller, there was a limit to how small you could go, which, um, which is, you know, an important result. So yeah, anyway. Let's continue, and I'm keeping an eye on the Wi-Fi. Okay. Okay, I see the Wi-Fi bars, like, doing the little, like, trying to connect thing. Yet the OBS stream says that I'm good, so I don't know what's going on. But I guess I'll just check again what's going on on my other account, okay. on my phone. I see the Wi-Fi bars, like, doing the little... Okay, I'm just going to keep going, I guess. 
even the Wi-Fi bar is just confused. Right. Okay. I so much prefer streaming at home. My Wi-Fi is more reliable. I have, you know, my own room to do stuff in. It's all so much better. But, you know, we're doing what we can do uh, here. Ah, yeah. So let's continue. In this atomic area, as you know, the Atomic Energy Commission has not been blind through the years to the civilian application for power and, of course, have been looking at power applications for military with more vigor in the earlier stages. Oh, is that? Okay, the stream went yellow. Okay. In this atomic area, as you know, the Atomic Energy Commission has not been blind through the years to the civilian application for power and, of course, have been looking at power applications for military with more vigor in the earlier stages of it than they were at the direct civilian economy applications. But until the last year or so, there were competent applied scientists who knew all of the facts that had evolved, certainly, up to a year and a half ago, and some of those that were right in the middle of it were of the views that the civilian applications, while certainly important to humanity, had a distant date because of economic considerations that you measure in decades. One of the ones who was right in the program and so had all of the knowledge from that side that I frequently talked with about it in the last year and a half has changed his views completely and says that he has and he now feels confident that and says that he has and he now feels confident that economic power will be with us in a decade. Yet until there was more information that came from his programs showing what economic factors could be, he was of the belief that it was a few decades at least away. Okay, let me try switching back to the student Wi-Fi because this one keeps going yellow in the uh, in the OBS screen. So, come on, other networks, other. Is the student Wi-Fi just dead? Okay, I guess the student Wi-Fi. Ugh, I don't want to be dealing with this. I'm so tired. Okay, I guess we'll just continue as is, and I'll keep an eye on the stream rate. So Dr. Evans asks, You say you did work with Bob Milliken. Yes, I did all my graduate work with Milliken from 1914 to 1918. And then... All right, now we get cross-examination. Spooky by Mr. Rob, who is played as... This guy, who's very fierce as he goes about his interrogation. So let's see how this goes. And let me just put them together for ease of switching back, back and forth. Okay. Dr. Kelly, may I ask what is your field? I got my doctorate with a major in physics and minor in mathematics and came to the Western Electric Laboratories in New York and which later became Bell Laboratories in 1925 as a research physicist and did my productive work as an applied scientist in the field of electronics. Since about 1936, I have been one with increasing scope of the technology that have looked at what others have done rather than doing it myself. So over the whole field of telecommunications and science and technology, I would say that I am expert. Are you what is described as a nuclear physicist? No, I am not a nuclear physicist. I have kept very conversant with it as an interested scientist, but there was in my student days and my active days, there was nuclear physics and as it evolved, I followed it closely. I have a number of nuclear physicists in my staff, among them Dr. Fisk, who was the first research director of the AEC, but knows as a particular part participant the nuclear fission field quite well. I have never practiced it, though. You would not offer yourself as an authority on nuclear physics. 
No, just as one with an understanding as an authority on the sh on the super bomb or the thermonuclear weapon. No, that is right. Who are the leading authorities in the country on the thermonuclear weapon? I would say that the outstanding nuclear physicists that are in the program, such as Bradbury and his immediate staff, and Edwin Teller, and Johnny von Neumann, would be names that would first come into my mind. Dr. Lawrence? Yes, again, Dr. Lawrence is not a participant in the sense these men are, but has a great understanding and came up through nuclear. I was not limiting myself to those who are not participating. He would be one of the great standing and the head of the laboratory doing a great deal in that field. Dr. Alvarez? Dr. Alvarez, who was on this committee, is another, yes. Of course, Dr. Oppenheimer. Dr. Oppenheimer, Teller, Bradbury, and von Neumann. Those are the first names that would come to my mind, but these that you add are in the same ballpark. Probably Dr. Oppenheimer would be preeminent, would he not? He would certainly be in the first four. Whether he would bat first or fourth, you would not want to say, but he would be in the first four. That is right. I would not be able to judge. I don't know what anyone could because there are different qualities to it. Dr. Kelly, in this report that you spoke of that your panel made in 1950, would that have been the report dated December 29, 1950? I would expect without referring to the note. Finally. <sighs> okay. I think I'm back. Okay. Okay, that took a while, but I don't know what's wrong. I don't know. So let's just get back to it, shall we? Uh, okay. So let's go back before we were so rudely interrupted. Dr. Kelly, oh wait, Rob asking Kelly, Dr. Kelly, in this report that you spoke of that your panel made in 1950, would that have been the report dated December 29, 1950? I would expect without referring to the notes that would be right. We finished our deliberations about the 22nd or 23rd, as I remember, and my letter from Mr. LeBaron is dated January 30th. He talks of the report having been received and studied. That is January 30th, 1951. So certainly it was issued sometime after December 22 and before January 30th. What, oh wait, Mr. Gray, not Mr. Rob. What was the date you mentioned? December 29, 1950. Do you have, oh wait, do you have any way of establishing that? I could easily get it from the Department of Defense. Perhaps I can be of assistance. In your discussions in that panel, Doctor, did you and your colleagues discuss the so-called superweapon, the thermonuclear bomb? No, we did not. It was not in the area of our cognizance. It was a research thing where it had not even been proven that it would be, and it was not in a stage where military application could be considered, so there was no discussion in the committee at all. Would you say that again? It was not in a stage of development where, as corresponded to the fission weapons, you could be talking about military applications knowledgeably and the different ways that you could use it. All the discussions, the formal discussions of the committee, if there were any others, it was individual and separate from the meetings I attended, was about fission and not fusion. In other words, you felt that the fusion weapon was something in the future, is that correct? That is correct. 
we were working for the Department of Defense and not the AEC, and it was not ready to be considered at that stage. Did you make any comment in your report on the matter of thermonuclear warheads or fusion weapons? I have not seen the report since it was issued. I would feel confident it was not there because I was not, it was not a matter of discussion. If it was, that is four years ago. I can't remember. It is three and a quarter years ago. Mr. Chairman, I would like to read the witness something from the report, which is classified. I have Q clearance. I can look at it. In that event, those who are not cleared in this hearing room will necessarily be excused. Since this is a report I wrote, is this one I may listen to? Absolutely, Doctor. Mr. Chairman, we hoped that this might not arise, but if it is the feeling of the board that it is important to its own understanding of the case to put this kind of question, of course it is entirely acceptable to us, and we shall withdraw. I believe that would be best, Mr. Garrison. Counsel for, for Dr. Oppenheimer withdrew. Ah, so they have now left the room. Counsel withdrew, because they don't have clearance. So that's tough. <laughs> Now Oppenheimer doesn't have his lawyer, his lawyers there. Uh, and also, this section of the transcript was classified for a while until being released recently. So transcript pages 199 through 201 being classified appear in a separate volume. That would be volume 2A. So now we're on the secret level here. So Let's continue with that. So classified portion of testimony of Mervyn J. Kelly by uh, cross-examination by Mr. Robb. Doctor, I have before I have before me a photostat from the report of December 29, 1950. I say that is undoubtedly the report entitled Military Objectives in the Use of Atomic Energy. Was that in your report? That is right. I would expect that to be the title. Submitted to the AEC of the Research and Development Board of the Department of Defense. Yes. I will read all the excerpt paragraphs I have here. One. Victory in general war in the near future is likely to depend on bringing to bear in all aspects of our military operations the maximum application of atomic weapons. The most urgent requirements for research and development lie in the field of fission weapons, intensive study of thermonuclear warheads, as has been established that they are more uncertain and much more difficult of development and if achievable much more costly in nuclear materials than were thought a year ago the determination of the feasibility of thermonuclear weapons is an important but very definitely long-range understanding more than five years this has been extracted for security reasons uh, then he continues only a timely recognition of the long-range character of the thermonuclear program will tend to make available for the basic studies of the fission weapon program the resources of the Los Alamos laboratory. Does that refresh your recollection as to your report? I have no doubt that is there. Those statements would have such a small impinging on my memory that I still don't remember any discussions about it. In the first place, the whole background of this and my expertness and contribution were the things that I knew as the technical leader of Sandia. As of that time, the thermonuclear had not reached the Sandia discussion stage at all. That is a long report, and that must be a relatively small part. Any statement about the status of the thermonuclear, I would have had to rely on others there that were in that. I haven't the time and don't attempt to get over into things that don't reach my cognizance. I knew... <sighs> don't do it. Let's 
going out again. Okay. Lie on others there that were in that. I. Okay. I guess we're back. Okay. Any statement about the status of the thermonuclear, I would have had to rely on others there that were in that. I haven't the time and don't attempt to get over into things that don't reach my cognizance. I knew the general situation and knew the discussions in the advisory committee and so on, but I had really not put my mind to the thermonuclear problem. It did not reach Sandia until quite a bit later. Dr. Kelly, upon whom would you have had to rely with respect to the thermonuclear matter? The people who would know as nuclear physicists that were there would be Bakker. The people who would know as nuclear physicists that were there would be Bakker, Alvarez, and Dr. Oppenheimer. I think all the rest of us would probably Lauritsen to a little less extent, but all the rest of us would have been dependent upon the judgment and the judgments of Bakker, Alvarez, and Oppenheimer. I would certainly have respected in that area, but I don't remember that part of the deliberations at all. It is blank in my mind. If they were in the committee, I don't remember them. Did you know Bakker and Alvarez at that time? Yes, very well. You have already said, if I recall, that Dr. Oppenheimer was preeminent in this field. That is right. Conclusion of classified section of Kelly testimony. So now we are back to the standard document, page 202. Mr. Gray says, would you excuse me? I think counsel can come back now. That is what I was thinking. I don't want them I don't want them excluded any more than necessary. So now the counsel for Dr. Oppenheimer has returned. All right. Counsel for Dr. Oppenheimer returned to the hearing room. Back to Kelly. It appears there is a reference to the thermonuclear job as being more than just in the future, and my comments, Mr. Garrison, were that is a complete blank in my memory, and I have not attempted to get a copy of that and read it before coming here. What I said was that the thermonuclear had not reached Sandia at all. While I knew the general situation and had not tried to follow it, so if it was discussed in the committee, I first said I had no memory of it, and I still haven't, but it must have been discussed, but I don't retain it. But at any rate, the thing it says there about the time of its development would have been a thing that I, in signing it, would have had to count on Dr. Oppenheimer, Dr. Alvarez, and Dr. Bakker as the nuclear physicists who would know and whose judgment I would have respected. But I can't recount because I don't remember any of the discussion between the three. Dr. Kelly. Were Dr. Alvarez and Dr. Bakker Dr. Kelly, were Dr. Alvarez and Dr. Bakker at that time, that is to say 1950, close to the program of the Atomic Energy Commission? Dr. Bakker had only recently resigned. I think it must have been within the year from the commission and gone out to Caltech, so he was pretty well up to date. How about Alvarez? Alvarez was in the radiation laboratory and was very knowledgeable on nuclear phenomena, phenomena generally, but what he would have known about this particular thing, having that knowledge, I would not know. He could well not be all current, but still capable of being so if he was given information. But Bakker certainly would have known because he would have been a part of the deliberations. Alvarez may have known, but I don't remember what part he had in the program at the time, other than being in the radiation laboratory at Berkeley. 
Doctor, would you search your memory, please? And, sir, tell us, was there any discussion in your meetings at the time as to whether or not the AEC had the capabilities, the personnel, and so forth to develop the nuclear, the thermonuclear weapon? Any discussion of the thermonuclear problem is out of my mind. I have to say frankly that it was such a small part of the whole and was so distant from the things that the committee itself would get hold of, I mean that the military could get hold of in the time immediately ahead, that it has not struck stuck with me as one of the more than minor things there. I just can't say. In other words, Doctor, is it fair to say that the thermonuclear problem, if we can call it such, was not a major part of your discussions, and was not considered at that time to be important, is that correct? It was not considered at that time to be ready with enough knowledge about it to consider the emphasis on the military application area. I see. It had not reached that state of development. I knew from visits from time to time up to Los Alamos, and I had heard some discussions from Teller and others of the pros and cons about the development, as people will discuss in that stage when there is insufficient data. Whatever discussion there was in this committee, I will have to say, not having refreshed my memory without reading it, I can't remember and would have said there was not discussion. Was there any discussion that you can recall of a second laboratory? No, not in this committee at all. Doctor, when did you say you first met Dr. Oppenheimer? It was at a meeting after the war in Philadelphia, where he addressed either of those two scientists that we, of those two societies that we belong to. I can't remember which it was. It was very close after the war because it had to do with these atomic problems, as I remember. I am not pressing for the exact date. I would guess 1945 or 46. It might have been early 1947. I cannot remember without refreshing my mind. Do you remember when you made that talk in Philadelphia? Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer says, may I answer? Yes. This was a joint meeting of the Philosophical Society and the Joint Academy of Sciences in mid-1945. We will give you the award for memory. <laughs> I made the speech. He made the speech. That is the first time I met him. I knew him by name. How frequently have you seen him since? It would average four or five or six times a year. Since I am only testifying directly as to one occurrence, this is the one occurrence where I had business relations, common obligations with Oppie, but I would see him at scientific meetings or at universities four to six times a year, I would say would be a proper average. But the occasion about which you testified was your intensive experience with him. That is right. This was one where I saw him in detailed action and taking a leadership as a good chairman should take. I think that is all I care to ask. Dr. Kelly, I'm sorry, I don't think I can ask this question because it involves the quotation. May I ask this question if there appeared in a report which you signed material which was not reflected in the discussions? Would you have raised the question at that time? Yes, I would be very meticulous about signing a thing if I didn't have views of my own from my own knowledge on sub to substantiate it. I would have asked afterward, or I would have had assurance from discussions that I do not know now remember. That is, I would not have signed with that in there at the time I signed the report without a feeling that it reflected the judgments of experts in that area that I respected. I understand that, and I think that is quite appropriate, as you have said earlier, that you would have relied upon the three members of this committee who were particularly qualified in certain areas. I am afraid I perhaps did not phrase my question adequately. I have no question about the reliability of your sense of dependence and confidence in the individuals concerned. My question really is, is it possible that this report could have reflected discussions which the committee did not actually engage in? I can't imagine that, because again, knowing myself, I am confident that as of the time I signed it, I would not have signed it with something in that 
I either had not heard discussed and felt satisfied with or raised questions about. But my mind is just blank on that, because it was such a minor thing of the things to get hold of with the military. You must remember, in a thing like this, you had the combinations of expertness. There were questions talked about in there about tossed bombing. Lauritsen would know a lot about it, but Alvarez or Bakker would not know anything about it. So it was a combination of expertness in different areas adding up to the total. It just happens that my memory over the years has just dropped out completely whatever their discussions were there were, even to the point of a comment as to the fusion weapon. Insofar as the military could do or the programming could do at that time, it is somewhat gratuitous because it just was not ready for the military to get hold of. You felt as a committee member for one reason or another that the military was not asking you to consider thermonuclear weapons. That is right. In the scope of the things that the military themselves would be concerned with, which really was the things at hand in the next year or so, there had been a meeting two years before, or a study of this kind two years before. It just was not in that ballpark. Were you engaged in the earlier study? No, I was not in the earlier study. It was referred to. I don't remember what was in it, but we had before us in the committee the study of the two years before. I remember having read it then, but I don't remember a thing that was in it now. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kelly, were you surprised how quickly they did develop the thermonuclear weapon after they started on it, or were you not? Sir, I was very much surprised. As a peripheral person on that and hearing the discussions about it before, there was data up at Los Alamos, and they were not discussions like this was business because I would not have seen them, I would not have been in them, but these were discussions proceeding. Cocktail parties on the hill where Teller and others were engaged in speculations. The general views I had of the discussions there was that it was a long, hard row. What year was this? This was along in the 1950-51 to 51 time. I can't place it closer than that. I was up on the hill. May I interrupt that you are in Washington? You are talking about the hill. You mean on the hill at, in Berkeley, California? Down in Sandia, we always speak of Los Alamos as on the hill. Okay, so that's important clarification. I thought he meant Washington, too. Uh, kind of like the, uh, the news site, the hill. Anyway, um, down in Sandia, we always speak of Los Alamos as on the hill. I would go up to Los Alamos about every other or every third trip to Sandia. At one of those in the early days of the nuclear physicists, considering the structure and problems involved, I remember a lot of uh, cryogenic questions. Just hearing those as a peripheral person cleared to hear it, the judgments I got and I well remember, it was a thing we would not have to worry about for quite a while. We meaning the Sandia Corporation. If you had to venture an opinion on it, your opinion would have been that it would have taken two or three years or longer than that. That is right. Frankly, I was and am greatly surprised at the tempo of advance, and I believe that all in the program are somewhat surprised at some of the simplifications that are coming to light after you get hold of the things physically and can see them. Would you put the Englishman Chadwick in that list of people that know about it? Of course, Chadwick was out of the program. This is not the king of thing, the kind of thing that we can discuss with Englishmen after the Atomic Energy Act. I was not directly in the program during the war, but Chadwick, John Cockroft, and among the names I would first mention in England of nuclear physicists who are very knowledgeable. But what they know about bombs, I don't know. While I see them at least once a year, we don't talk about bombs because it is illegal. Do you have any further questions? No. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. We appreciate your being here. Mr. Chairman, would it be in order for counsel to suggest a five-minute recess? 
Yes, we will now take a short recess. And then there's a brief five minute recess. I'm gonna take a sip of water. Anyway, you can see in the chat box all the chat successfully disconnected and chat successfully connected. Oh man. The Wi-Fi seems to have stabilized now. I don't know what the problem was before, but it was really annoying. Um, I would hope that doesn't happen again. But yeah, so this is pretty interesting so far, you know, um, it's getting a little heated. Uh, last yesterday's transcript was not that heated. It was mostly just Mr. Uh, Garrison asking Oppenheimer about his work and not much interjection, but... Now you've got, you know, Gordon Gray is not happy about the press coverage of the hearings. And, you know, Mr. Robb is cross-examining the witness uh, and sort of questioning how much he knows about uh, Oppenheimer, really. And so it's, you know, it's a pretty interesting read so far. But yeah, let's make sure the stream's healthy on my phone too. Just a double check that I like to do every once in a while to make sure that things are still going good. But yeah, let's make sure the stream's healthy on my phone too. Just okay. Looks like everything's good. So let's continue. All right. <sighs> Mr. Gray, the proceeding will begin again, whereupon J. Robert Oppenheimer resumed the stand as a witness and having been previously sworn was examined and testified further as follows. Direct examination continued by Mr. Garrison. Let's actually put these two together because it'll be switching back and forth a lot. Okay. Oh, I also need to update the other thing. Mr. Kelly has left the room. So he's out and Oppenheimer is back on the stand. So, yeah. Okay. Dr. Oppenheimer, would you care to make a comment about some of the matters touched on by Dr. Kelly in his testimony? If the board would permit it, I would like very much to comment on it. This panel meeting about which Dr. Kelly has told you I referred to yesterday. Could I interrupt a minute, please? The board will find the reference to this panel on the second page of Roman II membership on government committees, number 5B. It was next to the last item in my testimony yesterday, just before I told about VISTA. I told you the personnel and the critical atmosphere of the war. I would like to stick as much as I can to non-classified things. I believe I told you yesterday two things about the period of this report. One was that it was the period after the Chinese intervention in Korea when general war was very much in everybody's mind, as a remote but as an immediate thing. The second was that it was a low point in the prospects of the super. What you have heard reflects that opinion. Dr. Kelly would certainly not have been more than a bystander in the formulation of this opinion. As he said, this was not his job, but the impression created in his testimony seems to, be, seems to me to need amplification. Bakker was a member of the AEC until some time before. He was a continued consultant to Los Alamos and spent a good deal of time there. General McCormick was the director of the Division of Military Applications to the Commission and was responsible for Los Alamos, received regular reports from the laboratory, talked with everyone involved that he wished to talk with, and was well informed. 
Give me one moment to check. Okay. Okay. He is not a nuclear physicist, but he knew the views of nuclear physicists. Lauritsen is a nuclear physicist. His whole life has been spent in nuclear physics, except that part spent in atomic development. He was a consultant during the war and has been very close to the program of all forms of atomic development. Alvarez is a nuclear physicist of distinction and was, I believe, one of the initial promoters of the crash program for the super and has always had a great interest in the work. General Parsons was a member of the evaluations group at that time. He had been at Los Alamos. His job was to keep in touch with current developments. General Nichols, his status at that time, I have forgotten, but I think he was in research and development in the army. All of these men had access to every document and report that existed and were knowledgeable not as to deep problems of contemporary physics, but as to the practical problems and evaluations which were current in the various places where work was going on or evaluation considered. Berkeley was one of them, and Alvarez was there. I therefore think that there was a very substantial group of people, McCormick, Parsons, Bakker, Lauritsen, Alvarez, and myself, who knew what was believed at that moment and who had a chance to evaluate it critically. Any judgment that was expressed about the thermonuclear program could have been expressed only with the consensus, the complete agreement of all members of that committee who knew about it, and the undertaking on the part of those who didn't. One other thing. Walter Whitman was a member of the General Advisory Committee, and he had complete access to all reports and so on, and he was, I think, a member of the committee. The only thing I wish to protest is the suggestion that I was the only person competent to judge and that I sneaked a conclusion seriously. You're really going to do this to me? How often is this going to happen? I've got to do this somewhere else. Protest is the suggestion that I was the only person competent to judge and that I sneaked a conclusion seriously. You're really going to do this to me? How often is this going to happen? Okay. I guess the Wi Fi's back. Okay. The only thing I wish to protest is the suggestion that I was the only person competent to judge and that I sneaked a conclusion into the report that had not been thoroughly hashed out. I also concur with Dr. Kelly's statement, of course, that his primary interest was in other aspects of it. Uh, Mr. Rob, do you have any questions? No, not at this time. I think not, Dr. Oppenheimer. Would you proceed? And then Mr. Garrison asks, actually, wait, let me move this guy down because he's not going to be talking anymore. Um, okay. Would you tell the board now, Dr. Oppenheimer, about your appointment to the General Advisory Committee in 1946 and then something about its personnel and its purposes? I think I did describe my appointment, which was in late 1946. Our first meeting was in early 1947. I was held up by bad weather. I think Dr. Dubridge and I were both held up by bad weather and arrived late for the meeting. This is on the first page of Roman 2, item 4. When I arrived, I found the other members of the committee had held a meeting and elected me chairman. After consultation with the commission itself, I accepted that position. We agreed that we would elect the chairman at every subsequent meeting, that is, the first meeting of each year. I was re-elected at first without any concern on my part, but later with great concern. I will come on to that when we come to that time in the history. I think you have the names of the members of the committee. Yes. It is in my letter. I would only bore you to repeat the name, the names. They are right before the committee. And Mr. Silverman. There were not all members at the same time. 
these these were not all members at the same time. No, but I think that is spelled out in my answer. It is obviously an eminent committee and a varied committee. I can assure you that it was not a committee that regarded itself as subject to manipulation or that it was subject to ma manipulation. What was the statutory function of the committee? The law spells out that it is to advise the Commission on the scientific and technical aspects of research, development, production, materials, something along those lines, a rather clear mandate. We, of course, from the very beginning, recognized with relief that the job of decision-making, the job of negotiating with other parts of the government, the job of management, the final job of determination, rested elsewhere. It rested with the Commission, with the Department of Defense, that was to establish military requirements, or rather with the President, who, on the advice of the Department of Defense, was to establish military requirements, with the Congress that carried out the appropriations. Our job was limited to advice. A scientific advisor has, I think, one overriding obligation. It is his principle, one in which he is delinquent if he fa fails, and that is to give the best fruits of his knowledge, his experience, and his judgment to those who have to make decisions. He must attempt to study the problem, the problems that are put before him, to analyze them, to relate them to his own experience, and to say what he thinks will happen and what he thinks won't happen. What he thinks experiments mean, what he thinks will happen if a program is developed along certain lines. It is not possible to give this advice except against a background. That background is the kind of questions you ask. Very often, the things that are assumed in the questions you ask rather than state are assumed in the questions you asked rather than state. If you are on your toes, sometimes you can say that the question is not asked the right way, that a different question should be asked, but by and large, you will find yourself advising on what concerns the people to whom we are feeding advice. This, through the years, changed a great deal. I have already testified that as of early 1947, the prospects of any meaningful international action in the field of atomic energy were largely gone. The problem that we faced then was to devise a program which would regain some of the wartime impetus and vigor, and above all, to make available the existing know-how, the existing plant, the existing scientific talent, to make this available to the form of actual military strength. It was not so available as of the 1st of January, 1947. I need not go into the classified details. They are certainly available if, to you if you want them. In the period characterized by the Russian bomb and the war in Korea and the Chinese intervention, the background of many questions was immediate readiness for general conflict, or the best we could do with regard to that. In the last days of my service on the General Advisory Committee, one of the obvious questions was this. Since things are going quite well for us, what can we do, what should we do, to be prepared against enemy action? No doubt the enemy will have some time or other similar success. These changes in the nature of the background were always there, and I don't want to pretend that scientific advice in practical matters is like doing an experiment just for the purpose of satisfying your curiosity. The GAC did not, strictly speaking, abide by its terms of reference. I would say in two or three ways it did not. In the first place, in the early days, we knew more collectively about the past of the atomic energy undertaking and its present state. Technically, and to some extent even organizationally, or some parts of it, than the Commission did. The Commission was now, its staff needed to be recruited. We knew about Los Alamos, we knew about Sandia, we knew about the Argonne Laboratory at Oak Ridge, and it was very natural for us not merely to respond to questions that the Commission put, but to suggest to the Commission programs that it ought to undertake, to suggest to the Commission things that needed doing of a technical sort. Very frequently, we would be asked, what will be the best way of organizing this? What will be the best conditions for recruiting scientists and for making their work productive? We never regarded that as a serious violation of our terms of reference. As time went on and the Commission, through its staff and actually in its membership, knew more and more about the program, we tended to let the questions come from them. 
we would be confronted by great piles of documents and sometimes a set of questions about them at the beginning of every meeting. We would try to answer their questions rather than digging up from our own experience things that we knew. This transition took place as the members of the committee became more remote from direct participation in the program and as the Commission's understanding of its problems improved. Sometimes the Commission would address to us questions which were not obviously related to scientific and technical advice. I would mention at the, at the least three. The Commission reviewed with us its security procedures, the procedures, I think, under which we are now sitting. I believe their interest in doing that was to find out whether these would seem fair and reasonable to scientists. I don't believe we responded in writing to that, but we probably said that this looked like a very fair setup. The Commission reviewed with us very often the hassle about the custody of atomic weapons. The Act provides that the President shall arrange their transfer from the Commission to the military services. This involved, I guess, both technical and political problems. We, in this case, confined ourselves to talking about the technical problems and pointing out that there were much more important political ones which it was not our job to pass on. The very broad terms, and this of course I am coming to in a good deal more detail, in which the Commission addressed to us the question of the super bomb, was another example, I think, where it did not consult us purely on the technical problem, but asked advice in which supposed technical competence and general good sense were supposed to be blended. I haven't got all the examples, and I know many times we bowed out and did not answer the questions which were not technical and scientific. Often we were seduced into answering them. The committee during my chairmanship met about 30 times in regular stated meetings. I think the most impressive thing, maybe we did some good, but the most impressive procedural thing is that the committee had nine members. That means 270 attendances, and I believe there were not more than five or something close to that number of absences. That is, almost always everybody would be there, and it was a rare meeting where two people, if there was such a meeting, would be absent. There were occasions where a member was abroad, as in the case of Dr. Seaborg in our meeting in October 1949, but they were not frequent. This active interest and participation, I think, shows that the members of the committee, whatever the truth was, felt that what they were being asked to do was important to the nation, and they had a contribution to make. We had several subcommittee appointed, subcommittees appointed very early in the game, that is, into the natural divisions of the problem. A subcommittee on weapons, with Dr. Conant of Harvard as chairman, a subcommittee on reactors, of which I think Dr. Cyril Smith was chairman, and a subcommittee on research, of which Dr. Dubridge was chairman. We also had an ad hoc subcommittee, which lasted only a limited time to consider the problems of the best possible way in which existing or shortly to be available plant and existing raw material could be used to increase the quality and usefulness of the product. Here, I think only from the point of view of weapons. That is, how did you operate this plant? Did you operate them in parallel? Were they independent units? And so on. That was under the chairmanship of Fermi, who is from the University of Chicago. The committee, as such, had some foreign relations. By foreign relations, you mean with other agencies of government. Thank you, with other agencies of government. We met quite frequently, especially in the early days, with the Military Liaison Committee. It was usually present during our final report to the Commission. The Committee, at least once or more than once, appeared before the Joint Congressional Committee. Its members appeared in open sessions during the spring of 1949 and in secret sessions. We once, I think, called upon the President and wrote him an unclassified progress report. At the end of my service, we wrote him a top-secret progress report, which I sent over and talked over with him when I visited him. But by and large, our relations were only those established by law to advise the Commission, and we stuck pretty closely to that. There is an important qualification to this. Many members of the committee were consultants to one or another of the laboratories. Robbie, for instance, was a founder of Brookhaven and very much interested in it. 
Fermi was a consultant to Los Alamos, so was von Neumann, who came on later. Many of the members Many of the members of the committee had connections with Oak Ridge and the Argonne Laboratory. In addition to that, we were, of course, a part of the general traffic of scientists. We knew each other. Therefore, we had another function besides advising the Commission on technical matters, and that was to represent to the Commission, when it was a clear and obvious thing, the views of our colleagues and to represent to our colleagues the views of the Commission. I mean by this, those who were engaged in the work. If the matters were classified, those who were not engaged in the work, uh, if it were such a think as the support of basic science or a fellowship program or anything like that. Such a thing. There's lots of typos in here. Um, we got our information initially because we had it in our heads and had some reports left over from early times, overwhelmingly from commission sources but to some extent also by direct visits to the laboratories and by calling in directors of the laboratories, by calling in staff from the laboratories, so we tried to keep up to date. I think we had Bradbury on very many times to tell us about the weapons work in the early days. Our secretary was John Manley, and he was associate director of Los Alamos, so he would bring a report to us, sometimes semi-official and sometimes informal, of what was going on. We consulted with the directors of all the laboratories at one time or another, and where relevant, with the people in charge of production plants. We did one other thing, which perhaps was not quite within the terms of the statute. Occasionally, we would propose for the commission, or rather prepare for the commission, a statement of views which we would authorize them to make public. These were non-classified statements in hearings before the Congress or in any way that they wanted. Um, or in any way that they wanted. Yeah. Okay. I remember one such occasion when we thought a public statement would be desirable to set the atomic power problems in some kind of perspective so that people would not expect that coal and oil would be obsolete the day after tomorrow. We drafted a statement of this kind. First, it was secret, and then we got all the secret stuff out of it and handed it to the commission. It used, in some way, I think not a terribly effective way, in a report to Congress. I think it was used in somewhat, I don't know, again, typos. Um, I think it was in regard to the use of isotopes, the fellowship program, the promotion of basic research. We wrote several documents for the commission to us to use if it would do them any good. When you say, Dr. Oppenheimer, that the committee acted beyond the statutory frame of reference, what you really mean, I take it, is that you did not act in violation of the statute. Oh, no. But that it simply came about that the Atomic Energy Commission looked to your committee for help and guidance in ways that perhaps had not been foreseen. That is exactly right. The commission relied on us very heavily especially at the beginning, and relied on us for lots of things that were not provided for in the act, where we felt we could help them, we did. Our concern was to give them every possible encouragement and support. And then, as you testified a little earlier, as you testified a little earlier, as the commission became more and more expert in its own field, there was correspondingly less dependence for this kind of assistance from the committee. That's right. Now, would you tell the board something about what the committee actually did and begin with the first meeting? My recollection is not clear as to what happened at the first and what happened at the second meeting, but I think this is perhaps not too important. Very early in the game, we thought it important to see whether we agreed or had any views at all about what the job of the commission was. That, of course, was the commission's business to determine, but the nature of the advice we gave would be dependent on that. Without debate, I suppose with some melancholy, we concluded that the principal job of the commission was to provide atomic weapons and good atomic weapons and many atomic weapons. This referred to atomic explosives. There are other things like the atomic submarine that you can call an atomic 
There are other things like the atomic submarine that you can call an atomic weapon, but that is not what we had in mind. We thought it had... Okay, let's see. The Wi-Fi keeps going in and out, and I'm tempted to switch over back to the student Wi-Fi. Okay. That looks all right. Okay. All right. Cool. So, yeah. We thought it had three other undertakings. We thought from the first that however remote civil power might be, the commission had an absolute mandate to do everything it could economically and fruitfully to get on with the exploration of it. We thought that the commission needed to respond to requests from the military and needed to assert the military estab establishment as and needed to alert the military establishment as to other applications of atomic energy of military use of which propulsion, radiological warfare may be two examples. I won't attempt to evaluate them at this moment. The third thing that we felt, and it was not really third in our feelings, but simply in a budgetary and practical way, was that the commission had a mandate to stimulate basic science in the country. The training of scientists, I guess just the acquisition of knowledge is what the law states. At that time, there existed in the Office of Naval Research one very good government agency, which was promoting basic science in many different fields with great forethought, wisdom, and skill. Some of the things the Office of Naval Research did touched on the field of the field that the commission was in on atomic science. We never had any feeling that it was bad for the ONR to be in that. But this was to come up over and over again, and I will return to it a little bit later. These were the principal themes that occurred to us at the first meeting, and the one that separated itself by urgency and importance in our own minds was the weapons field. That required attention, first of all, to the state of affairs at Los Alamos. Yes, I think perhaps I should say that we did at one early meeting consider whether Los Alamos was the right place for weapon development. This is now 1947. This would be early 1947. It was set up during the war for reasons which I went over yesterday. It is remote, it is expensive, it does not have very free access to a university or laboratories not under its control. There could have been arguments that a fresh start with something of the vigor that Los Alamos had when we began it might have been desirable. We concluded at the first meeting that this was impractical, that Los Alamos had proved itself and its survival value by being there, by having a good staff, it was working on atomic bombs. It was not only working on atomic bombs, but doing a lot of miscellaneous physics and chemistry. But it existed, and the notion of starting up something else or tearing this down seemed to us full of dangerous delay. So our first set of recommendations to the commission was addressed. I think there were a lot at one time, but at any rate, first among the recommendations were the recommendation to get Los Alamos going as a really first-rate place. The commission had asked us, either at our first or second meeting, to review the report I described yesterday on the job in atomic energy, which we had written for Mr. Stimson's panel. They asked us the questions, have any of these objectives been attained? They had not been. The time was rather short. The objectives were not easy. I think we said, strictly speaking, none had been attained. There are some now that ought to be added that have come up in the meantime. That report was not entirely complete. We suggested that every inducement be made available to make work at Los Alamos attractive in the way of salaries and housing, but above all, in the morale sphere, in the sense of giving the men who were there the feeling that they were doing something vital for their country, and in getting abroad in the country, in the sense that Los Alamos was not something left over from the last war, that work on the atomic bombs was somehow not an entirely credible occupation, but quite the contrary. 
feeling that there was nothing the nation needed more. This did result in vast building programs at Los Alamos, in the expansion of the laboratory, in the availability to the laboratory of a great many people who were not trafficking there at earlier times. People go out now for the summer months and have been for the last five or six years, and they come as consultants. There is hardly, there is barely a clear, I mean, this just is hardly, there is hardly a clear and qualified scientist in the country who is not available to Los Alamos for consultation or for such things as he is good for. They have established a scheme of subcontracting, which enables them to draw in even further resources than they can put on this relatively limited mesa. I am not going to talk, I am not going to take all the recommendations of our early meetings. In the first place, I have not looked them up and I don't have them in mind. I will rather follow the weapons themselves. There had been, I think, some thought about weapons development after I left Los Alamos. There was one meeting which I could not attend on the thermonuclear program, and there were lots of things left over from the wartime to get people interested in making better weapons. Better here meaning a whole lot of things. It means obviously getting more bang for a buck. It means more economy in the use of fissionable material. It means getting weapons which give you the maximum versatility in the kind of delivery system we have, so you don't have to use very big bombers and so on. It means versatility in the size of weapons and their explosive effects. It means the ability to use the fissionable material that are produced in some reasonable proportion to how they are produced and in some reasonable recognition of overall economy of neutrons and production facilities. Very early in the game, it became clear to us that nobody was going to pay attention to improving weapons. All that happened is that there were lots of blueprints and lots of models lying around, and the only way to get this business really moving was through a testing program. The payoff with atomic weapons is to see if they really work as we think they do. Sometimes you do this test to prove out a model which is essentially what you think is right. Sometimes you do it in order to see as well as you can by experiment, how things are working in the explosion and guide you in future design. Good tests usually combine these features. I believe we were extremely strong in urging that a test facility be established. I know that we worked quite hard to get accepted the initial Los Alamos program for the Anywedoc tests, which were a little more ambitious than was generally approved and were where we felt they were reasonably very much needed. We were worried about the test site out in the Pacific as the only test site because of the cumbersomeness and the long advanced planning that was required. But the problem of getting a continental test site was one to which we could not contribute much except to say that it was very much needed and that we hoped it would be available. May I ask, when you say we, you are always referring to the GAC. For this field, I am talking about the GAC. There were points on which we had differences of opinion. They were not very frequent. I believe in the weapons field, they were not very major. There were differences of opinion about the proper way to get reactor development going, and perhaps some difference of opinion about the value of various forms of military propulsion. What I am reciting now, I believe to be unanimous. Dr. Oppenheimer, in all of the recommendations that were made throughout these years from 1947 to 1952, during which you were chairman, did you concur in those recommendations yourself personally? I mean to say that if there were differences of opinion, were there any instances in which recommendations were made in which you did not concur? I think there may be that there were, but I don't remember them. They were not on points that seemed of great importance. May I ask, as a matter of practice, if the committee made a report and then if members had some difference of view, they were reflected in a separate memorandum? The way it worked is the following. 
Maybe I had better go back to procedures. The meeting was generally opened by a meeting with the commission, sometimes with the military liaison committee, at which the commission would discuss with us what was on its mind, what advice it wanted. There would be a period of briefings in which documents were brought in and the staff came and very often members of the various laboratories came and told their story. Usually there, were, there was more to consider than could be adequately considered in a two or three day meeting. We then would go into executive session, go over the program allowed and being, and begin to talk about questions. Sometimes it was clear that the answer was obvious. Sometimes it was very tough. Sometimes we felt that the right answer would be very difficult for the commission to carry out, and we had the problem of giving our advice to the commission in a way which was both honest and useful. When we were about clear as to what we had to say, we would meet again with the commission and occasionally with the military liaison committee, and at that point I would usually summarize out loud what our thoughts were and a record would be made of that. If I knew of divergences of opinion, I would call on those If I knew of divergences of opinion, I would call on those who had any divergent opinion to express their differences. If I didn't know about any in any case, I would go around the table asking for comments. There almost always were some comments because I had forgotten something, or I had given an emphasis which was not right, or someone wanted to strengthen what I had said. This oral report I then made the basis of a letter to the commission, which was our immediate report to them. This was circulated to the members of the committee who could approve it, and it was brought up for approval and amendment at the subsequent meeting as to whether it was an adequate expression of the committee's views. I remember one instance in which there was a dissent, one and only one instance, from my representation of the view of another member who said I had not given it straight and who wrote a letter amplifying. We also, not always, but normally, kept minutes. I say not always because I have the impression that the most controversial meeting in the light of history, that of October 1949, minutes were not kept. The meeting was too hectic or something. The secretary never wrote them up, but wrote notes afterward. You know that better than I do. The reports of the commission, of course, though they usually were top secret or often top secret, were the commission's property, and if it wanted to send them over to the Joint Congressional Committee or the Military Liaison Committee or anyone else, that was fine with us. The minutes of the meeting, which often told what kind of hassles we had, what kind of arguments or considerations we made available to the commission to throw whatever light they could on what we knew and what we thought, but we asked them but we asked them not to distribute the minutes since they identified individuals as saying this or that. I think this is how the record was kept. I wanted the board to be sure, Dr. Oppenheimer, that when you recount as you are about to do, and indeed as you have already begun doing, some of the important things that the committee recommended to, to the commission and urged upon it in the national interest, that they were all actions in which you yourself wholeheartedly approved. If I, have, if I had dissented, I would certainly have said so. So that the board can understand that you were really ta talking as much about your own views and contributions as you were about other people. Yes, although I need to make one point clear, it is very important for a chairman to get everybody into the act and not to dominate a meeting. I think my normal practice was to bring up a question and then see what other members of the committee would say. I would not wish to testify, and I can't testify, that the views which I came out of the meeting with were always the same as the views I went into the meeting with. This was a matter of discussion. Sometimes new facts were brought to light, sometimes we learned of things we had not known before, sometimes people talked me out of what I originally thought, but I certainly never incorporated in a report anything different than I thought was the best advice that I would give at that point. You have spoken now about the stress which the committee laid on the importance of tests for the development. Sorry, Wi-Fi stuff. Whenever I see it go red, I'm 
I just repeat stuff. Okay. You have spoken now about the stress with which the committee laid on the importance of tests for the development of atomic weapons. Do you want to say something about some of the other aspects of weapon improvement which you pressed for in those days? Pardon me, but may I ask one question about these tests before you leave that? Oh, sorry. Dr. Oppenheimer, were there what we might call bad tests that did not come up to your mathematical calculations? I am not sure whether the answer to this is classified or not. Maybe I should not ask it. The security officer has left, but I will take the chance. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I will hold the question. All right, the answer is of some interest, but not, I think, in connection with whether I am fit to serve the country. If the chairman would like, we would be glad to step out. Let us not have any more classified stuff than we have to. I ought to say that at our first meeting, or two, I don't remember which, we brooded to a very considerable length about the thermonuclear program. I think the, stat, the state of affairs was that not much was known about it. It had not been pursued very vigorously, and the unknowns overwhelmed the knowns. Just to recapitulate, the work in the thermonuclear field began when at Los Alamos? The theoretical work began in Berkeley in the summer of 1942. The thermonuclear work was pursued merely as a theoretical job and not a developmental job. I think it would naturally have been somewhat intensified after the war with the view of making better measurements and better calculations because it was one of the interesting things to do. The question we tried to ask ourselves was, is there enough in this so that it ought to be pushed or is it something that will be a distraction from the very immediate job of getting some weapons into the places where they are needed? Our answer was, I think, the following. That it was a very interesting problem or set of problems that if work were going on at Los Alamos, it would distract first-rate theoretical physicists and that the probability was that if people studied the thermonuclear problems at Los Alamos, this would help the other program rather than hurt it because it would have the effect of increasing the brains and resources of the laboratory. I will have to give you a complete review of the thermonuclear thing, but this was our initial recommendation. We made a number of other observations relevant to the weapons program. I think one of the important ones, I am not sure we were the first to do it, was to keep asking the commission not how many bombs should they make, because that was not our job, that was the job of the military establishment, but what were the real limits on how many they could make, how much material could be made available because even though very great strides were made between 1947 and 49 in the effectiveness with which material was used, there was still the question, is the plant we have being used in the best possible way? Is there any inherent limitation to, on the plant? Is there enough raw material to sustain more plant? Is there any way in which you can re relieve the limitation on raw material? Does this come back to a dollar limitation? We address to the commission from time to time questions intended to make clear to the military establishment that the requirements they were placing for atomic weapons were perhaps all that could be done right then with existing plant, raw material, operation, and bomb design, but by no means at all that you could not that sorry, but by no means at all that you could do if you really set to work on it. The very large expansion programs, which of course were not approved or formulated by us, were certainly in part stimulated by the set of questions. Therefore, ha sorry, there have been several expansion programs and the whole atomic weapons capacity has risen enormously. It took quite a while for this to take hold, but I think we started on it fairly early. We were very concerned. I think probably this concern reached its maximum during the Korean War, but started earlier and continued later, to adapting atomic warheads so that they could be used by a variety of carriers. This sometimes meant developing designs which were not from the point of view of nuclear physics the most perfect design because you had to make a 
compromise in order to get the thing light or small or thin or whatever else it was that the carrier request required. But experience showed that almost every improvement that you made in trying to make, let us say, a physically smaller atomic bomb was reflected in an improvement in the performance of the larger ones. So this thing began to unroll. You could not really tell whether an effort aimed at making an atomic bomb that you could shoot out of a machine gun, to take an obviously unclassified example, would not also help the very large bombs, which are the most efficient. This had something to do with trying to bring together the enormous program of which our chairman surely knows a good deal of missiles and the adaptation of weapons plants in and missile, missile plants. In this connection, we welcomed the building up of Sandia that Dr. Kelly has described to you, and tried generally to get as much coordination between the hardware side and the military application side and the development of the atomic explosives themselves. I believe we were rather early in this preoccupation, which later became quite general. We were concerned with flexibility and made a number of recommendations to the commission, which I need not spell out, the purpose of which was to be sure that if during a war you found out bombs you had were not exactly the one you wanted, you could do something about it. We felt that no amount of crystal balling would make it certain that your stockpile corresponded to what you really needed in combat. We suggested a variety of devices by which you could take advantage of what you learned in combat and come up quickly with what you needed. I have listed these as some of the things about weapons. I have obviously left the hydrogen bomb for a separate item. I might run rather briefly through the other aspects of the committee's work that I have mentioned. The war almost stopped the training of scientists in this country, and this started up again at an accelerated pace under the GI Bill and the rest of it. But it was very, it was very clear that there were not enough people in the country to do the things that were needed. The couple of billion dollars which we now spend on research and development is not at all spent on the salary, salary of scientists, but it is very often bottlenecked by scientists. It seemed to us that the source of all this was universities and university training. It seemed to us that the source of all this was the research in universities, in other words. It seemed to us that the source of the good work that had been done in the war was not in applied science, but in the pure scientists who had learned their stuff in the hardest of all fields, the exploration of something that is really not known and really new. We encouraged the commission to take a number of steps which we thought would help this. They have, first of all, their regional laboratories, of which Brookhaven is a good example. Argonne is a good example, Oak Ridge, and Berkeley. There we tried to get the commission to do something which was only partially successful, but has been quite successful in Brookhaven, and that is to separate as sharply as possible the secret and sensitive things which ought to be guarded and restricted, and the things that are just published all the time in the journals, and therefore make it possible for these facilities to serve as a wide as wide a group of people as possible without involving delays and clearance procedures, and in order to maintain really secure the things that were secret. We tried very hard to get the commission to support work which was not directly obviously related to the practical applications of atomic energy. There were arguments in those days that the commission was so short-handed, so in need of physicists, that the best thing they could do was to make it hard for physicists to get jobs so that they would come and work in the various laboratories. We thought that was quite wrong, that the best thing they could do was to support physics in the universities, that this would provide the young men, and it has, of course, who would be able to man their various laboratories in the years to come and they should do at least as well as the Office of Naval Research in those fields of sciences which, by statute, they were supposed to be responsible for. Atomic Science and Chemistry, Physics, Geology. They have done this, and anyone who picks up a contemporary physics journal will see in its innumerable examples where it says that this work was supported by the AEC. The level of 
The level of activity in physics, especially, but also in chemistry, has been very much raised by their efforts, and the number of people practicing has been enormously raised. What is more than that, if you go now to a contemporary Atomic Energy Commission laboratory, a lot of the bright ideas and a lot of the best work is done by men whose names were not known seven or eight years ago, and who have precisely come up through university training in the meantime. This is true of Los Alamos, and it is true of all the others. I think on this we probably pushed the commission, and they regarded us as people who were, after all, largely professors and university presidents, and we were pleading a special interest. We did plead a special interest, but we believed it to be the national interest, too. Where possible, in basic science, we urged the commission to make its unclassified facilities available on a worldwide basis. A good many scientists from friendly nations have come here to do experiments, to learn techniques, and also to teach us what they knew. And there are magnificent examples of international collaboration that have taken place in the Commission's laboratories. I think the most striking is probably known to you. In 1947, I guess the big accelerator at Berkeley started operation. Maybe it was 1946. People immediately looked to see whether the new high energies that were being provided were creating mesons, which we knew were created in the cosmic rays, but which were not artificially created before. They looked for months and months, and the reports were negative. This seemed very puzzling from the point of view of the theory. A young Brazilian, who had been studying in England, arrived at the radiation laboratory, knew the technique used there, exposed a few photographic plates, and there were the mesons. This is a small illustration of the need from the scientific point of view of the international collaboration. I think I need not point out that it is also a very limited but a very healthy element in the general structure of our alliances and in the good feelings that exist between people in other countries and here at home. The Commission has, I think, and we so represented it, an obligation to make available to industry and to technology and medicine those facilities which by statute it and only it can operate. It has fulfilled this very well. The distribution of isotopes has begun, had been begun by the Manhattan District. It has been enormously expanded and speeded up and improved by the Commission. This is one example. The use of the reactors for both secret and non-secret work is another example. I don't know how much you have found it profitable to leaf through the GAC reports. I am sure you will find in them just countless occasions where either in general terms or in specific terms, we tried to steer the commission on a course which would enable it to do the maximum for American science. I am not so proud of our record in the reactor program. This we never managed to give as effective advice about as I wished. We worried a lot about it, and you will find that if the advice was not good, it was at least copious. I think one reason for the difficulty is that progress in reactor development, whether for civil or military purposes, is a very expensive thing. It is the kind of thing you don't do in a small university laboratory. It is a big industrial enterprise. It may cost $10 million. It may cost $50 million. It is not something you can just try out for size. We found it very hard to compose the conflict between the need for an orderly and, ah, for an, yeah, okay. Sometimes the typist leaves out a lot of spaces between words. Anyway, we found it very hard to compose the conflict between the need for an orderly and comprehensive and intelligible program of reactor development and the inevitable enthusiasm which groups would get to have for their own pet baby and which maybe was a reactor which was not especially illuminating from the point of view of the program as a whole. We thought at one time that this could be helped by centralizing the reactor development work and so recommended to the commission. This was one of the recommendations which was opposed. Fermi thought this was bad advice. In any case, it never happened. So we don't know whether it would have been good or not. We tried very hard to get some kind of policy committee of the people who knew about reactors, and that was formed a committee of Oak Ridge and Argonne and General Electric scientists so that they would get some agreement and not all push their own babies. 
We strongly urged the commission to get somebody in Washington who was an expert in reactors, and it turned out to be the director of reactor development, Dr. Hofstad, who ha held that job from the beginning. I am not clear that he will be on any of your lists. What in the end happened was that we began to sort out better, and the commission began to sort out better what the reactors were for, and therefore have more rational criteria of which ones to build. They were for production, the production of materials for bombs. They were for military propulsion. They were for learning about reactors so that you would know how to build the next ones better. These three purposes I think we recognized in 1947 or 1948. After that, I think the commission's program began to take extremely good shape, and we have moved very far. We always liked the submarine reactor, not only because it would be a usable thing in warfare, but it looked close enough to civil power, re relevant enough to civil power, to be of interest from that point of view too. I believe we dragged our feet very much on the initial plans for flying aircraft with nuclear power. It seemed to us a very long-range thing, and one that ought to be approached in the spirit of research rather than have a definite development and commitment. When I last heard about it, this was the state of affairs. This brings us logically to the report on the H-bomb in the fall of 1949. I don't know whether the board would think this was an appropriate point to adjourn, or whether we should go ahead and start on it. I think we should start on it, Mr. Garrison, if you don't mind. The story began, the story begins, I take it, with the Russian explosion of an atomic bomb on September 23rd, 1949. I don't think the story begins there. I will go back a little bit. We can begin in the middle and go both backward and forward. In September of 1949, I had a call from either General Nelson or Mr. Northrop. They were involved in the detection net for Soviet atomic explosions, or anyway, for foreign atomic explosions, and they said that they had something very important. A little later, I came down to Washington and met with a panel. I see it says in my summary that this was advisory to General Vandenberg. I never was entirely clear as to who the panel supposed to was supposed to advise. This appears in the exhibit. That is right, this was Admirable, Admiral Parsons, Dr. Bakker, Dr. Bush. Where is that? And then... It is item 6, comma, 2. Yes, I have it. I think I had seen a good deal of the evidence before the panel was convened. In any case, we went over it very carefully, and it was very clear to us that this was the real thing, and there was not any doubt about it. We so reported to whomever we were reporting, I think it was General Vandenberg, this was an atomic bomb, or at least it could well have been, and there was no reason to doubt that it was a good one. Yesterday, you read evidence that in 1948 I was not thinking it would come so soon. That was the prevailing opinion. In every meeting of the GAC, nearly, we had a briefing on what was called atomic intelligence. It is common knowledge that prior to the Soviet explosion, the earliest possible date was considerably later than the actual explosion, and the probable date quite a lot later. The fact is, we didn't know what was going on, so this came as an immense shock, and to everyone involved clearly meant some rethinking of many aspects of U.S. policy. I went over to the State Department where the question was being discussed. I asked to go over by the Undersecretary, should this be publicly announced by the President, and I gave some arguments in favor of that. I don't know who finally resolved the matter, but the President did make a public statement. I was taken up to hearings before the Joint Congressional Committee. General Vandenberg certainly appeared, and probably Admiral Hillenkutter, and other people whom I have forgotten. The committee was quite skeptical, skeptical as to whether this was the real thing. Is this, is this the GAC? No, the Joint Congressional Committee. They were quite skeptical, and I was not allowed to tell them the evidence. It was understood that this was to be kept secret. All I could do was just sound as serious and convinced and certain about it as I knew how. 
I think by the time we left the joint congressional committee, under I think I think by the time we left, the joint congressional committee understood that this event had been real. I do remember Senator Vandenberg's asking me, and it was the last time I met with him, he became ill not long thereafter, doctor, what do we do now? I should have said, I don't know. I did say we should stay strong and healthy, and we make sure of our friends. This was immediately before the GAC meeting. The committee had a whole lot of stuff on its docket. I have forgotten the details. There was a docket for us. We disposed of that business, and we talked about the, this event. At that point, Dr. Robbie returned. He had been in Europe on the UNESCO mission. He read about this in the papers. The president had announced it. He said very naturally, I think we ought to decide what to do. I think we ought to advise the commission. I opposed that. I think most of all other members of the committee did on the ground that it might take a little while to think what to do and also on the ground that may that many of the things to do would be done against a framework of governmental decision as to which at that point we could only speculate. During October or late September, I think October, a good many people came to see me or called me or wrote me letters about the super program. I remember three things. Dr. Teller arrived. He told me that he thought this was the moment to go all out on the hydrogen bomb program. May I interrupt? I'm sorry. This is following, following the GAC meeting of September and prior to the meeting in October. Yes. Dr. Betha arrived. I think they were there together or their visits partly overlapped, although I am not sure. He was very worried about it. He will testify. Okay, one moment. Okay, I'm going to have to stop for the day because I reserved this room until 5 and it's almost 5. So we're going to stop for the day uh, here at page 250. So yeah, um, so far very interesting stuff. Um, you know, the commission's not happy, or the board's not happy. Well, really, Dr. Gray, he's really not happy about what's going on with the press. Uh, Mervyn Kelly from Bell Laboratories uh, talked about, you know, his experience on a panel with Oppenheimer after the war and, you know, how, how that went and how he had a lot of faith in Dr. Oppenheimer. And then it went back to Oppenheimer's testimony about various things that he did, uh, and it's interesting, we're getting into stuff surrounding the first Soviet explosion of a nuclear bomb in September of 1949. Uh, this meeting of the GAC is depicted in the Oppenheimer movie uh, in black and white from the perspective of Louis Strauss. He is not happy and he is very gung-ho about the hydrogen bomb program as a solution to this threat. Meanwhile, Oppenheimer uh, in the movie, at least, he opposes it, and he says that now would be the time for uh, treaties, international co cooperation. So it's interesting that obviously Oppenheimer is really trying to downplay this because uh, he doesn't want to appear that he's being like weak or anything, or that he was sabotaging the security of the U.S. But according to the movie, he did actually oppose the hydrogen bomb quite vehemently. So we'll see how he talks about that, like what context he puts around that. Anyway, that about does it for me today. Um, I will have to investigate these Wi-Fi issues further. I'm not sure whether these are a product of this particular room or if it's just the campus Wi-Fi is on the fritz in general. I'm not exactly sure and I do apologize about the interruptions that caused. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. So I hope to see you all next time where we continue on volume two of the Oppenheimer security hearing.